welcome once again as we take time to study from the book of Mark, our Sabbath school lesson. And uh, so far, we have been able to track the journey of Jesus while he was on this earth as ministry. Today, we are studying lesson 12, which is the culmination of Christ's ministry on this earth, where he has to succumb to the Jews and the punishment that they brought on to him through the Roman government. And we would see intricately the details that are so clearly mentioned, like we have been you know, studying that the last few chapters of the Mark are basically comprising of just the last week of Jesus' life on this earth. And it has been given with crisp detail all the events that uh, led to Jesus dying on the cross for us. So let's all bow our heads and give this time for the Holy Spirit to guide us. Father, we once again call upon thee. We pray that thou would allow the Holy Spirit to draw us closer to thee. Help us to be always indebted and grateful for the sacrifice of thy son on the cross of Calvary, through which we have been redeemed of our sins. And we pray that we could act and be like true Christians who are waiting for thy second coming. Thank thee for thy mercies upon us. For I ask these few words in thy holy and righteous dear name. Amen. Our lesson is entitled, Tried and Crucified. The memory text is taken from the book of Mark, chapter 15, verses 34. It says, And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a very famous verse that we know, and it is something that we are going to discuss from the Wednesday portion. But we see that the lesson is taken from the book of Mark chapter 15, and we are uh, continuing from the point where Jesus is first taken to the Jewish Sanhedrin, where he's accused of blasphemy and the punishment for being accused of blasphemy in the Jewish tradition was, of course, death, but they could not carry out that execution all by themselves because the Roman government would not allow them to execute their own. They could not take the laws into their own hands. And so when we head into Mark chapter 15 and his account of Jesus' last uh, days on this earth or his, the final point where he's tried and executed, we see that early morning, Jesus is taken to Pilate. It says in verse 1, And straight away in the morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes, and the whole council bound Jesus and carried him and delivered him to Pilate. And this is a crucial point to understand the regularity or the accuracy of the event being described here, because the fact that Jesus was delivered to Pilate in the early morning gives us a good index of the accuracy because the Sanhedrin, it was necessary for the Sanhedrin to bring to business anything that they had to, to Pilate soon after the dawn because that's when the legal trials of the Roman Forum used to uh, be carried out during the early morning. And so during the early morning, they take Jesus to Pilate and we do not really get a description of what was the sin that they were accusing Jesus of at that stage. But the first question that Mark describes in verse 2 gives us an understanding of what could have been the accusation of the Jewish Sanhedrin in front of Pilate when he asked Jesus, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And so they would have realized that if they brought Pilate to Jesus and said that he is a person who proclaims himself to be God, Pilate would just yawn or laugh it off because the Romans themselves had many gods and they would say that we also have many gods amongst us. If one more gets added to it, it is not really a great issue. It's not a big issue for someone to be tried. But they realized that if they put him in a political spot where they called him to be as one of the king of the Jews who would be in direct contradiction to Caesar, who was the Roman emperor, 
it would feel like he was going to usurp his throne and be a political power. And so that's what they accuse Jesus of, of proclaiming to be a king of the Jews. Before that, it was blasphemy. Now it is the king of the Jews. And what was Jesus' answer? It says, and he answered and said unto them, thou sayest it. So Jesus' response to that is a, a response that is not very direct, but you understand why he would give that because in his heart, he knew that, of course, he is the king of the Jews and not just the king of the Jews. He is the king of the world. So it's a very non-committal reply to that, where he does not deny the title or affirm him. But he knew that he was the king, but of a different sort, not the sort that Pilate was trying to think who Jesus was. And it was very crucial for them to take Jesus to Pilate because Pilate did not have a good reputation amongst the Jews. He was considered as a person who was very cruel, tyrant, a person who hated the Jews. And the understanding of the Jewish council was that if they brought Jesus to him, he would certainly receive a death sentence, a death punishment, for the simple reason that Pilate did not like the Jews and would end up, he had a reputation of bringing harsh punishments on the Jewish nation. And so when they bring him to Pilate and Pilate asks him that question, Jesus' response is very non-committal. And the chief priest accused him of many other things, but he answered nothing. And so Pilate said, Behold how many things they witness against thee, but you have nothing to answer. So Pilate marveled. And now there was a tradition during that feast, the feast of the Passover, where they had to release one prisoner, whomever they desired. And so Pilate was in this situation because we know through the book of Luke also that Pilate found no fault in Jesus. And he knew that Jesus had done nothing wrong. But because these people had envy in their hearts against Jesus, Pilate knew that that is the reason why he is being brought to him for a trial. And so he takes this opportunity because Pilate had that situation where either he could do something right, which was to free an innocent person like Jesus, or he could do something that would be politically correct, which is to bring it to the crowd. And so if the crowd would ask to release Jesus, Pilate would have played his political part where he would have paid heed to the Jewish council, but also freed the innocent man. And he thought that it was only the Jewish leaders who had a problem with Jesus, but not the crowd. And so he said that there is a person who was Barabbas, who was actually a murderer, and was there caught. And Pilate asked, whom would you want me to free? Would it be the king of the Jews or would it be this man, Barabbas? And so he said, what he will I release unto you, the king of the Jews? And so he said and got an answer that they wanted Barabbas to be released because this is what the Bible says in verse 11. But the chief priest moved the people. The chief priest also had the people on their side and they shouted, rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will he then that I shall do unto him, whom he shall call the king of the Jews? Pilate's first opportunity to try and save Jesus was in vain, because they wanted to free Barabbas. And so Pilate asked them, What then shall I do with Jesus? Because he thought maybe they might say that, Okay, beat him, hurt him, but do not kill him. Maybe that's the most severe form of punishment that they would ask for. But verse 13, says, and they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said unto them, what evil has he done? And they cried even more exceedingly, crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. Pilate had an opportunity to do something that was right, but he chose his political acumen to preside over what was correct. He did not want to lose his place. He did not want to lose his seat. And so he handed over Jesus to them and prepared Jesus to be scourged, which was the preparation for a person to be crucified. And we realized that the Romans had formed a very, very harsh way of crucifying a person where he was scourged. Initially, he was beaten by at his back with rods and sticks that had bones, teeth, many sharp objects that would literally uh, pierce the skin, literally abrace it, and it was very painful. Jesus was already in a weakened state because of all the ministry, all the walking that he had been doing before 
this time and Jesus was physically weak and here they scourge him, they strip him of his clothes, tie him to a pole and then lash him with leather whips to which pieces of bone, glass, stones and nails were tied. After this, the soldiers did not stop at that. They continued his humiliation by clothing him in a purple robe and placing a crown of thorns on his head. Basically, Caesars at that time also were given a purple robe which marked them as the emperors or the rulers of that nation. And here to mock Jesus as the king of the Jews, they also give him a purple robe, give him a crown of thorns on his head. And there was a huge battalion. The irony can be seen even in, because Jesus really is a king. Even though they are doing that as a sign of mockery, Jesus was actually a king. And we see if we read in the verses, going on from verses uh, 16, Soldiers led him to a hall. That's where they clothe him with the purple robe. And they tried to salute him saying, Hail King of Jews. They smote him on a head with a reed and did spit upon him. And bowing their knees, worshipped him. They initially gave him a stick, which is like a scepter, which is given to the rulers to rule. But with that same stick, they start beating him and spat upon him and bowed on their knees as a sign of mockery trying to worship him. And after they had mocked him, they took the purple robe off him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. Now, most of the people who were led for the crucifixion were carried out naked. But the Jews were a conservative society and they abhorred public nakedness. And so, after the, public, uh, the purple cloak was removed from Jesus' body, they gave him back his own clothes and then they carry out the procession of crucifixion, which was another sad event that went on. Because the crucifixion was supposed to be a deterrent to the society around. So what would happen is that the centurion would carry out the procession on a horse, followed by a person who would claim loudly the sin or the mistake that the person had committed for the reason that he was going to be executed and crucified, followed by the accused who would carry his own cross behind them. And a huge procession would be carried out throughout the city, which was supposed to act as a deterrent for anyone who was planning to commit such an act. And so they carried Jesus, the cross behind him, and brought him to Golgotha, which is a place of skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And so when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour that they crucified him. That's the description given. And we understand that the crucifixion was not in any means a simple thing. It was one of the most painful deaths a person, a victim or a sinner who had done something wrong could ever experience. Because when they put the person on the cross, they would pierce the nails through his palm at a point where there were not many blood vessels. It was not a very bloody affair, but it was a very painful affair because the median nerve would pass right through that and it would pierce, the nails would pierce that nerve and the person would have excruciating pain that he had to bear and Jesus had to bear that pain. His feet were nailed to the cross. The posture or the position of a person on the cross was in such a way that even to breathe, they had to put a lot of effort. They had to breathe by putting the pressure on the feet which were already nailed to the cross. In fact, the most common cause of death while they were on that cross was through asphyxiation because they could not breathe because of the pain and the muscles would start cramping at that stage. The position, the posture that a person had to maintain on the cross would itself make it so difficult for a person to continue living. It was the most painful death. Apart from that, there was mockery that Jesus had to undergo even at that time. They gave them a wine that was like an anesthetic drink which would reduce the pain, but Christ even refused that. And when they had crucified him, like I said, they parted his garments also. And at the third hour, they crucified him. And also on his cross was written the king of the Jews as a sign of his accusation or the mockery that they were 
doing that. And with him, they crucified two thieves, the one on the right and the other on the left. And so the scripture was fulfilled, which says he was numbered with the transgressors. And while they passed by him, they still continued their mockery, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroys the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. They kept mocking Jesus that if you are so powerful, if you are the king of the Jews, come down from the cross. Don't be there. Chief priests also mocked him with the scribes, saying, Himself he cannot save, and he claims that he has come to save the world. Let Christ, the king of his right, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And that they were crucified with him, reviled him. And we know when that happens and darkness went over the whole land in the night hour, as we read in the memory text, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachitani, which is interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We see at this stage that even Jesus felt and realized the partition or the separation from his heavenly father. Such a white rites in the desire of ages, Satan with his fierce temptation wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror, or tell him of a father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was supposed to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the father's wrath upon him as a man substitute. So even Jesus at that stage, at that moment, felt a separation. Would have thought maybe sin is so offensive to God that I would be eternally separated from my father. And Christ felt that pain when he was on that cross. And at that time, many people, when he said, Eloi, Eloi, Lama, thought that he was calling out to Elijah to come and save him. And at that stage, Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up his ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to bottom. And there were also women looking on afar. And one was Mary Magdalene, the other was Mary, the mother of James. And while all these people happened, and the evening had come, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph or Arimathea, an honorable counselor, was also waiting for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. Now Joseph, we know, was keeping silent or he remained quiet during the initial uh, trial of Jesus at the council initially. He kept quiet. He knew that Christ was right. He could not say much at that point. But later he goes on and proclaims in front of the whole world that he believed in Jesus. He goes boldly to Pilate. In fact, when the people were crucified, when a person was crucified, he was stripped of all his rights, even the right of burial. And so the extreme, one historical detail that is extremely important here is the verification of the death of Jesus. When Joseph of Arimathea goes to him, goes to Pilate at that stage, he appears for the first and the last time during in the book of Mark. Mark chapter 15 verses uh, 43 says, he went there, waited and boldly appeared in front of Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. But Pilate was surprised that Jesus was already dead because he did not expect uh, someone to die so soon. So he summoned the centurion in charge of the crucifixion and asked if Jesus was dead already. And the centurion confirmed that. The centurion would have seen enough deaths on the cross to know that Christ was dead. This was important because of the later claim by some that Jesus did not die on the cross but only fainted. The Bible gives a very clear description or a very clear answer to that confusion that many people have. The testimony of the centurion to the Roman government directly counters that as an assertion. The Romans did, after all, know how to execute criminals. 
So what does Joseph do? He brings the linen shroud to wrap Jesus and he laid his body in the tomb from the rock. The tomb was large enough to walk into. Along with Joseph, the high school writer also notes the two other women who were there, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph. These two, along with Salome, watched the crucifixion from a distance. In fact, many claim that it would have been the tomb of Joseph himself that he gave away for Jesus at that stage because people, there was the tradition there that people would build and prepare their own rooms for their death. So maybe at that time, Joseph gave away his own tomb for Jesus' death. But obviously, Jesus did not use that for long because he rose up on the third day and rose to be with his father, preparing place for all of us. As the lesson points out, how ironic it was that Jesus' followers were missing in action during the time of his death, while a member of the Sanhedrin himself, the very body that condemned Jesus, became the hero here. And so the question rises that how can we be sure that in crucial times, we are not missing in action either. We could be like the Peter who kept saying that I will not forsake you. I will not deny you. But at that time was nowhere to be seen. But here remember who was initially part of the body which condemned Jesus came forward and proclaimed to the whole world that he believed in Christ and he believed in his kingdom. Important lessons for us to learn through the time when Jesus was crucified on this earth. There were many who mocked Jesus, but it was Jesus who stood up and won the battle. Upon Christ as a substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. Person who knew no sin was made sin. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now with this terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face when he was on that cross. But we understand that through his sacrifice on the cross, even for the chiefest of sinners, salvation was there. It was given. But Christ had to go through great agony my friends, for the sins that we have committed, Christ had to undergo a lot of pain. The idea of being forsaken by his own father crept into his heart because he knew that sin is so offensive to Christ that it can cause an eternal separation. Are we in that same boat? Are we doing things that might eventually cause an eternal separation from our Heavenly Father? Because if we are, then we need to come back to Christ. We need to call upon his name this day. Thank him for the sacrifice of his son and plead to forgive us for the sins that we have committed, to repent of our old ways and to once again draw closer to him. May this study be a blessing for all of us. Shall we all bow our heads once again for a word and prayer? Father, we once again thank thee for thinking about us, mere human beings. Sinners though we were, thou made a provision for us by sending thy son to die on the cross. We know and understand the pain that Christ had to go through just for us. And Father, we know that even we have been called to undergo that if the need be. When we are called by thy name, to be persecuted in this world, we pray that thou would find us faithful at that time. Pray that thou would be with us in a very special way. Thou would mold us and fashion us according to thy will. Prepare us for thy second coming. For I ask these few words in thy holy and righteous dear name. Amen. May God bless us all.